Merci, merci beaucoup Leïla. Merci au département de géographie à l'ENS pour m'avoir accueilli pendant euh, ces deux mois et euh, pour m'offrir un peu euh, d'espace euh, loin de Beyrouth pour pouvoir réfléchir. Euh, je suis très contente de voir certains des étudiants qui étaient là pour la semaine PSL. Et puis, je voudrais aussi vraiment remercier Agnès d'avoir fait, euh, d'avoir accepté ce rôle. Euh, Agnès, qui, je dois dire, depuis que j'étais étudiante, doctorante, a été une référence, quelqu'un qui m'a beaucoup aidé à construire ma recherche et puis qui, qui reste une collègue que j'apprécie énormément. Donc, merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Leila, euh, pour, pour cette occasion. Et puis là, I'll switch to English because it's much easier when I'm going to talk about work. So I hope people don't mind. Um, so the research I'm going to, pr to present today is really an attempt to go back to a project that I started back in 2010 and that I really built between 2016 and 2019 with a group of young researchers uh, at the American University of Beirut in what eventually became the Beirut Urban Lab. Um, it's very collective. It's done with a lot of collaboration and thinking with these uh, young colleagues uh, that, uh, that were first students, as you will see. And then, uh, just as we were starting to write back in 2019, the protests began. And instead of writing this up academically, we took this research and went to the street. And Dana's here, and she remembers we were share, doing, a, basically putting our, our findings in flyers, trying to uh, push it in the public realm, uh, make it something that influences change in Beirut. And in the process, a lot of the thinking has moved and changed. And so in the last 10 days, <coughs> two weeks, I've been, bless you, I've been trying hard to sort of stitch it back together, and it's grown enormously. So um, you'll excuse the mess at the times that it shows up. It's really an effort to put together something that should be a collaborative book uh, that I'm leading, and um, that I think is incredibly important to think the current moment in Lebanon, but also well beyond Lebanon, the current moment of southern cities that are increasingly affected by financial booms and busts and by the penetration of multiple layers of capital into their fabrics that, as I will try to argue, are profoundly influencing the way people relate to the city, move in the city, and practice it in their everyday life. So that's the project. Um, between 2004 and 2013, Beirut experienced a decade of frenzied building boom. And that's what you're seeing here. So this is a time series of building permits filed and built in Beirut during uh, the post-war period. And what you see is that following a first boom that happened uh, immediately after the Civil War, there's the first bust that's then followed by another boom, a period of explosion between 2004 and 2013. During that less than a decade, actually, 10% of the city's residential fabric was redeveloped. Literally, 10% of Beirut's building were demolished and rebuilt. And they were rebuilt in high-rise apartments, spreading, as you can see on the map, in all quarters of the city. A survey of all constructions conducted this, during this period indicates, when we look at them, that most of this development is actually residential. So while you see during the first phase, until 2000, uh, it's relatively 50-50. After 2000, the entire, almost the entire building development is actually residential. Ultimately, some 82% of developments are residential. A decade later, as you can see on this graph, the boom has turned into a bust. Looking at what's left of the housing stock, we find that there are some, so we see, we see this development. It has really very clear characteristics. Uh, on, a lot of it, 17%, but almost 30% of the city's footprint is actually high-end apartments. So they're above 300 square meters uh, and uh, typically uh, have a view either on the sea or in Beirut downtown. Um, another 20% are actually the smaller units. And as you can see, they spread all over the city, but they also spread in what I will show to be a rather segregated spatial organization. One of the main characteristics of this urbanization is its extreme high rates of vacancy. So uh, as city planners, we tend to work with 
up to 7% we tolerate vacancy. So the, in the lowest income neighborhoods of Beirut, where we surveyed vacancy by literally going building by building and asking how many apartments are unfurnished. So if an apartment is furnished and occupied by an expatriate who comes twice a, twice a year or once a year for two weeks, it's not vacant. With this count, we are getting to 23% in total being vacant. The lowest rates in Tari Ejdide, which is the lowest income neighborhoods of, of Beirut, are about 15%. It hits above 50% in the city's historic core, redeveloped Port Solidaire and the port area. So extremely high vacancy rates across the board. So extremely high, but also increasingly also segregated. So what we've colored here in an attempt to show that spatial segregation is in red, the high-end developments I pointed out above, and in blue, basically buildings that have received some a number of uh, subsidized housing loans. Uh, so subsidized housing loans are loans that are uh, obtained from, uh, from, from the public housing agency. So they basically point to the lowest income groups in the city. And you can see that they cluster in specific neighborhoods. So this story of boom and bust, increasing segre uh, segregation, high rates of residential development, high rates of vacancy has become quite familiar for us, right? We've seen it essentially described first in London, in Paris, in uh, New York, but also increasingly in Sao Paulo, Cape Town, Istanbul, and more recently also Cairo. The dominant explanation for a story like that is that we are dealing with global neoliberal capital. So the built environment has become what David Harvey has called a spatial fix uh, for capital. So whether you're a neoclassical economist or a neo-Marxist, at whatever place you are in the spectrum, you tend to think that capital has a propensity to basically coalesce in the built environment and that this tendency has intensified after 1970 and the fall of the Bretton Woods Agreement. Since then, of course, financial capital has increased enormously. This is what's been called financialization. Um, and I use this term very carefully because it's widely overused in the literature. But it points to an increasing dominance of financial actors, markets, practices, measurements, and narratives at various scales, resulting in a structural transformation of economies, firms, states, and households. And I'm quoting Albers here. So this use of the term financialization exploded in the last decade, especially after the 2008 crisis, which is widely believed to, be, to have tied the centrality of finance to the urban scale. Financial capital, so that's basically capital that is earned in something other than commercial or productive uh, functions in investments, has been, has been widely found across the uh, cities to heighten the interdependence of capitalism and city making. Um, it's prime the prime of place in this is the sector of housing. So when you read about financialization in the urban, very often the intersection is in the residential sector, and you're seeing it here on the graph very carefully. Um, uh, in what uh, Fernandez and Albers have pointed to as a defining component of financialization of housing, which is the transformation of residential real estate into a financial asset. So it becomes a place where capital can be extracted. So that seems to be like sort of the narrative. So are we to accept that cities, our built environment, are going to be always in this constant state of change and transformation? One that some of my colleague architects like Rem Kulas have even celebrated, right? It's delirious, it's normal. Is Beirut the victim of a natural propensity of capital, the short-sightedness of capitalists who over-invest and inevitably um, fall into crisis? Um, I want to first point to uh, the way in which uh, Rachel Weber has reacted to this proposition, pointing to a notion of constructed cycles that, that are used in our daily terminology to basically naturalize uh, the flow of capital in the built environment. So when we say, yes, capital works like a flow, and we're here surrounded by a lot, a lot of economists in the building, uh, economists tend to want to study these as cycles to uh, basically uh, plot the curve and give them a predictive dimension. Uh, but as, ever, uh, as Weber point, uh, points out, cities are not hardwired hard -wired to behave like radio waves. Instead, I think it's important 
to, to argue that there's nothing natural in this circulation of capital and that we should probably study um, instead how, uh, how and why it circulates in the built environment. Um, now, there's something puzzling about this curve and what you see in Beirut and in many other cities of the South. Because on the one hand, if you follow this financialization literature, you would expect to see that for this residential boom to happen, that there must have been a lot of financial instruments that were introduced in cities. So we're expecting securitized mortgages, we're expecting a lot of private equity funds, hedge funds, stock exchanges, uh, it's, uh, uh, financial measurements, credit scoring. And what we're seeing is that when we look at cities of the South, and I'm thinking here of, for example, um, Cape Town, Cairo, Istanbul, we see on the one hand that the symptoms of what financialization creates, which is high vacancy, um, uh, while you have a housing crisis and homelessness, a very high cost of housing, when at the same time uh, wages are not going up, we see that these symptoms are clear, but on the other hand, none of the tools is actually present. And so that sort of made me want to push this further and, um, and understand how it works. And what I'm going to try to argue today is that Beirut city builders of the post-war period uh, are, are not financialized in the sense of these tools, and yet they do form several overlapping and intertwined growth machines that are rooted in the overlapping geographies of the city and beyond, and that they reproduce through their interventions a highly segregated and divided city. So rather than the seamless flow of capital that we're asked to imagine uh, with financial instruments that abstract space, in Beirut, capital flows are facilitated by an array of decisions that are orchestrated by a relatively small group of actors that span banking, political, and development sectors. To date, even, when it uses, uh, even if it uses some banking instrument, capital largely flows through families, kins, political, sectarian, religious, and geographic networks. This points to the fact that many of the studies about the transformation of housing into an asset across the global south and maybe beyond may be missing the deep transformations of cities if they are measuring the penetration of capital simply through instruments such as mortgages. And so we've seen a lot of these studies that sort of uh, try to measure the extent of financialization penetration in Istanbul or in Mozambique, and that conclude that, well, capital has not penetrated so much. And I think that the main reason why this is the case, and that's my big argument, is that we're looking for specific instruments and tools instead of actually looking to understand what are the conduits that actually allow capital to penetrate. There are, of course, other ways in which the study of financialization in the South has been uh, um, short in coming. Uh, one has to do with the fact that a lot of this, these studies use macroeconomic indicators, that they tend to be number heavy, done by economists, in, while cities of the uh, global South have been increasingly unmapped. We know much better uh, about Beirut's maps and its production in the 1950s than we know today. Uh, same for many other cities uh, around the world. Uh, there's also a tendency for scholars to study cities of the global south as if they're uh, in a developmental framework. So we study them as informal settlements, we study them as uh, neighborhood case studies. We don't tend to study them as places in which finance uh, coalesces. And, uh, and so all these make it really hard uh, to study this. And it was very much in the spirit of countering this tendency and really relocating, understanding first what had happened in Beirut for this graph to be real, uh, that we started this project. And the first step was really an effort at mapping. Um, an effort at mapping that began with the making of a base map for Beirut. So what you're seeing here is the Beirut Built Environment Database. It's uh, the pride of the Beirut Urban Lab. It's the collaborative work of two GIS, three GIS researchers, colleagues in engineering and uh, in the Department of Architecture and Design. And what we've done is over months, we basically went to public agencies and mapped lot by lot 
the boundaries of the lots, where they stop, from the cadaster back to the lab, with aerial photographs, until we were able to obtain a georeferenced, clear, reliable map of Beirut. And during the q and I'm very happy to talk about how useful this has been as uh, in organizing activism, creating networks, transforming actually the way we do things. Uh, but that was sort of the first step. Um, this, this deliberate effort at mapping that recognizes in unmapping um, the ability or the, the trend that we uh, live in Beirut and beyond, which is that of we don't really know what is happening, so everything has to be ruled by exception, uh, everything is unclear. This effort at mapping sort of seeks to counter it. So we uh, added to this map uh, an Excel sheet that had all the buildings that were filed and permitted in the post-Civil War period. And we went and we surveyed them all. So that was a team of 10 researchers uh, with their phones, uh, gathering characteristics about the buildings that included building heights, building uh, um, occupancy rates, environmental characteristics, how they relate to the street, et cetera. Um, and most important in this case, who, are, who is the developer who developed this building? Because that's a piece of information that you don't find on building permits, and that can give you a lot of insight on the production. So ultimately, this was the BDD survey, 2,300 units, that then allowed us to overlap with these kinds of, um, of, of maps, but also to conduct the kind of analysis first that we are told needs to inform a study of financialization. So I'm going to sound a little bit like an economist for you for a few seconds, uh, and I apologize for that. But my first attempt, our first attempt as a team, was to really try and map, and now we've extended it till 2021, the building activities in relation to the foreign direct investment. So the question is, to what extent do we talk about financialization? And this is actually missing the price of oil that would show you how well it actually functions, all of it together. But it clearly shows a very strong correlation between building activities uh, and um, the, the, direct, the foreign capital that is coming from abroad. Um, you see it very clearly here on the number of transactions that are occurring in Beirut, even better, so that completely works, and even more so in the case of Lebanon. Um, so in a sense, if we follow uh, Fernandez and Albers and agree that Beirut has, uh, is in a position of subordinate capital, uh, we indeed agree that as a peripheral city that doesn't have a production, uh, the capital, the built environment is extremely influenced by flows of capital that come from abroad and that basically generate uh, building activities. However, I think that graphs like this tend to conceal and to uh, even more than what they explain. And I'll just give you a few points to hopefully convince you. Uh, first, when we talk about uh, an asset class attracting global investment, and we look at these capital flows, we have a very limited idea about uh, who actually is sending that money. And Julia Tierney's dissertation has clearly shown that a lot of, most of this money is Lebanese expatriates. So basically, we're not thinking of like this global flow of capital that's abstract, that's erased. It actually flows through networks and social relations of expatriates. A second point is that it gives us a fake sense of knowing. So we have a sense that these transactions, they have fixed values and that these are the transactions put by the market. In practice, those of you who are following the unfolding saga in Lebanon today know that if you're about to buy an apartment in Beirut, um, if you're paying in Lebanese local dollars, you will pay a very different price than if you're paying in cash dollars. But if you're paying in cash dollars in Dubai, you can pay less than if you're paying in cash dollars in Lebanon because of the, capital, the informal capital control, right? So the value, even more because of restrictions on flows of capital globally, if you're paying in capital in, ca in, in uh, bank dollars in Paris, you will pay less than if you're paying in bank dollars in the Arab Gulf. So basically, the value of the dollar itself is not the same. So when we start imagining that, that the same apartment is valued the same way, we also assume the seamlessness of capital that I think is very problematic, especially in a context where value is so much up for grabs that even the value of money is like questionable. And, and finally, I think what it really conceals 
is these kinds of graphs. So over months, we basically uh, tried to map every single decision that was made by the public actors in Lebanon to influence the flow of capital in the built environment. And what you see is over these 30 years, there has been an enormous amount of uh, transformations in how we register property, how we build to incentivize building higher, building, um, building uh, being able to register uh, property at lower rates, but also incentives to allow banks to invest in real estate, facilities, lifting restrictions on banks from being able to do that, and then a whole array of mortgages. And mortgages are really used as an instrument to encourage people to invest in the built environment. So the first mortgages are introduced in the early 1990s, and these mortgages are uh, limited. They basically tend to uh, target relatively middle, lower middle income families. But the more there's a need to keep capital, the more the mortgages are facilitated to the point that by 2014, the central bank is actually giving subsidized loans for $800,000. So four or five loans and you're there with, uh, with the amount. It's a, it's, a, it's a crazy thing. Now in parallel to this and to again understand this curve, we have to locate it in the housing policy framework. And so in this graph, what we try to do is to map vertically over time the kind of policy that is issued and horizontally whether that policy reflects the use value of land and that's going to be on this side for you or the exchange value which is going to be on this side for you and what you see is a gradual shift over the years of how public policy is made towards housing and emphasizing completely the shift from housing being a place to live in so rent control um, uh, creating a public housing agency, earmarking land for building public housing, to in the 1990s and beyond, we begin to encourage people to invest in real estate, to have mortgages, uh, we give subsidies to developers. So it's a very different approach to how housing um, is produced. Uh, these interventions are, uh, of course, uh, again, I mean, the state, uh, terminologies like the state, uh, interventions, capital flows, banks may seem abstract, but I think it's really important to remember, and I'll talk about it a little bit more in a second, that capital has a face, uh, that these are people, networks, names, interests, and that what we really need to do is, uh, whether we're studying financialization or capital alone, is located back in its political economy and try to look at the people-made institutions and practices through which this capital falls. Um, and so in that attempt, what, we, what, what one wants to do is basically try to uh, understand who is influencing these public policies and who is building. And so that led us to another piece of the investigation, which is the anatomy of the growth machine. Um, so in this graph, what you see is an Excel sheet that began with 2,300 names of developers, again, collected on the streets in Beirut, and then an effort to reduce the number by seeing who is who, who is using the multiple companies under the same name, and through this effort, consolidating really the list to what we have right now, which is about 999 uh, names. Um, we first started by uh, seeing the distribution of who is building what, and not surprisingly, you can find that 30 developers have built most of what was developed in, in the city in the last 30 years. Uh, when we look at their distribution, and we'll talk a little bit later about who they are and what they do, you, I'll, I'll just point out to one thing. They are not all corporate. They are names. The, the person who had built the highest number of buildings in Beirut, I've been doing urban research for 20 years. I had never heard his name. So people who are not necessarily in your social network, not on TV, not, set, not, not in the decision-making circles. Yet, uh, when you trace their, ne their networks, what you find out is that these 3% who have developed most of the cities actually are all networked to either political or, um, I'm, I'm mixing up two arguments, excuse me. So I'm just going to go back first to point to the concentration of building, uh, showing that um, these 30 developers who represent only 3% of building activities in the city have built about 30% uh, of the city. Uh, and they tend to build 
across all the areas of the city. Now, the second point is to network first these 30 developers, but then all the developers in the city. So we went back and uh, the amazing team, not myself, um, started mapping for every developer who is he connected to, who does he know? And so we did an Excel sheet with all the names of people on the boards of banks, all the people who have served in parliament for the last 30 years, and finally, uh, this superb tool that was put out by uh, activists in Lebanon, which basically connects every network, every, comp every name to who else he works with, allowing us to create, to, to tie in networks that we could verify, we no longer can because now all the websites are down, in the commercial registry. And by doing that, and then spending a substantial amount of time visiting the Facebook pages of every one of those guys to see with who they, uh, where, where do they spend the Eid, who do they go congratulate for the new year, uh, what do they celebrate after elections, who they, do they endorse. What you get is that at least three quarters, 75% of developers in Beirut have a very visible, so that's, I mean, you know, you're scoping cover, you're still not going in depth and talking to people, and you already see 75% of these developers are tightly networked to political class and bankers. So those of us who have been activists will tell you, yeah, we knew, right? I mean, that's obvious. I don't think it's obvious, and I think it's very important to understand it, because that's how we begin to understand, to, to, to quantify and to map and trace how that seamless thing called capital is actually appropriated, twisted, mediated, translated in the city, and how, how we also stop thinking of the market as this abstract real market, and instead really uh, located in its... Uh, in its setting and to push light on um, how does it work and to do this research you actually need like uh, fine-grained research by insiders so every student who worked on this project worked on the neighborhood where she grew up where she uh where she knew the neighborhood um heard a hundred times despite explaining that she's conducting research, I'm only saying this to you because you understand what I mean, etc. And this is all really important because it gives you a sense of the thickness of what is happening. So the first <coughs> was covered by Saham Nenne and it was Tari uh, Ishdide. So for those of you who know a little bit Beirut, Tari Ishdide is that considered in popular parlance as Hazen and Mustafa. There is an war art of future movement. Uh, which is the political party of the former prime minister, Rafi Hariri, and then his son, the strongest to date, the strongest Sunni force in the city. Um, the IHTT is also the chap cheapest meter square in Beirut, so we're talking about $3,000 square meters into uh, three thousand dollars per square meter in 2017. It has many religious Sunni organizations that the Mokhastad and the al Qaeda, but also recent NGOs like uh, uh, and Futuwa, but also uh, the offices of the Future Movement and of Burabi uh, We counted in this neighborhood 167 buildings we developed during this, the period of study, um, and 15% of the stock is empty. Only 6% of the residents we interviewed in these new buildings had used housing loans. So if we begin by thinking of financialization simply as it's the more niches, then there's not much financialization. But is that the case? So based on the analysis of who are the developers that uh, were mapped, interviewed, analyzed one by one, we found out one big bang, two individuals, which still have called foreign corporate, but really they're more or less from the neighborhood and have connections in Turkey and in uh, Saudi Arabia. And then about the bulk being built by uh, the professional or uh, rising developers. These are individuals who were born and raised in Tari Ishdide. Um, typically, they've gone to the Beirut Arab University, which is the big university inside Tari Ishdide. Um, 81 of the 82 are Sunni, Muslim Sunni. One is a convert. Uh, and they basically, when you ask them about their strategies, they would tell you, I can only sell uh, to Sunnis. Um, some endorse it. Many others say, if I said to a Muslim Shia, it would ruin the world building, no one would want to buy. So very much, um, it's not a seamless capital that is, again, flowing. It is working through very specific networks that treat 
that organize a territory, uh, they will blame the landowner for not uh, the, with whom they partnered, partnered for not being willing, uh, not wanting to to start Shia. Many serve on the boards of religious institutions um, for whom they build complexes, sometimes as volunteer work. Uh, these religious institutions are incredibly important because they basically give them we start yet trust a good reputation in the neighborhood, which then attracts clients um, for whom, uh, which is what is important. Um, so they're not, they're, they're not small developers. The biggest developer in Beirut, the one that has built the biggest number of buildings in the city, is actually one of those. So we're not talking about small guys, most have, but they work in very small offices at most 10 employees. Um, they usually partner with the landowner and the family. Um, there is what you see here, the other two thirds. These are guys who are trying to build networks with the Tari HD, the origin and the Brit, who are more attracted by Tari HD because it's affordable. But still, these guys have to work with, uh, with the existing network uh, and try to, so they're attracted to the neighborhood because it's more affordable than others they can build, but they have to work through the networks. And it's very clear in their discourse and what they do that they are, um, that they are trying to, um, to enter a tight social network. Um, they're not simply uh, operating within a fixed environment. Of course, they're reproducing and creating and transforming the environment. Um, so they're not members of Ridal, which is the official real estate company, uh, but they have formed a recent, they have joined a recent one, which is more regional, based in Turkey, called IGBDP. Several of them have at least joined it. And it's trying to create networks across uh, uh, countries. Yes, Sunni and highly celebrates and the one, check the West and West West countries. Um, so what are the main sources of funding? Uh, all the professional and developers never go to the banks. What they used are siblings, relations. So they have a brother who's making a lot of money in the Arab world or in Africa and sending some of the money and that's what they're using to mail. Uh, forward payments, they make, uh, they send a few units at much cheaper rate to local clients. And um, sometimes they may, uh, so 70% of the buildings had at least one forward payment at the time it, before it started. And they secure money through families, neighborhood relations. Um, and, and they're really clear about not wanting to use the max. So I'm going in the interest of time to just go through these quickly, but show you some of what we can directly on the slides without anything. Um, so we've, we've mapped these networks and you can see here this attempt at connecting two different networks that work together. One connected more with Basharia, which is a religious political organization, and the other more around the future movement. The future movement gives a fantastic relation with the municipality because the mayor is elected, but in reality, really is chosen by the head of the Mustaqbal. And uh, you can see that this our relationship of siblings, family, brother, cousin, and then uh, occasion and partnerships that basically are organized. And on the very clear geography. So when we mapped all these developers, where else do you build? They only built either inside the territory more or dice or in the neighborhoods of Shemun and Aramun, which are overflow neighborhoods where um, Hadiri, when he was first elected, for you who are interested, basically promised to help create affordable housing by expanding the boundaries of the city. So a highway was designed, have a barker that uh, about planned this very nicely, and that becomes a way in which uh, there is an overflow outside the city. Now, one thing that a trip that's interesting is that these developers would often send someone um, a unit in Aramun and then take back the unit and use it as part of the payment for people to be able to move up to Tari Ashtin there because people are unhappy to live in the suburb. So there's a whole network of arrangements that work in between these families that facilitates these kinds of transactions. I know I'm running short on time, so I, I want to pick up. So that's another case that was done by another uh, researcher at the Lab Abdi and that was again her thesis. So in this case, I made chose to work on two neighborhoods that are contiguous, Aisha Bakar and Tert uh, Kentayat. Again, they're very uh, a very Sunni neighborhood in West Beirut. Um, again, it's a neighborhood where she grew up. 
uh, that she knows really well where her family is very ingrained. And it's a neighborhood that's known for its very strong uh, religious identity. Unlike Tabi Ejdide, Mustaqbad is there, but in a much lower uh, presence. Instead, the strong footprint here is for the religious organizations. And um, when we when we mapped the uh, the relations that she was able to find, uh, she was able to classify three types of developers, particularly because she sort of stepped in a relatively higher income neighborhood, which is that the Khayyan. Uh, she is able to find something that she calls more corporate. So these are bigger organizations that operate at the scale of Beirut and possibly beyond that are more professional, that have actual offices and bigger operations. Still, the majority of the developers that she was able to map are people who are doing their first or uh, second building. Again, a lot of the same practice. So for those who work in Aisha Bakwar, they're small scale, they're, tip, they're all men. No? Uh, the 999, I forgot to mention this point, there's half a woman and 998 men. I said half because she's partnered with a guy. Um, but uh, other than that, they're all men. So, <laughs> so it's, a man's, uh, it's a man's business. Um, they're educated in the Beirut Arab University. Most are either original of uh, Aisha Bakar or Tari Ishbide. Uh, and they uh, basically, again, work through uh, family networks. Uh, and they all trained as engineers and architects, and they really work through social networks and families. The difference between them and the Tari Ishbide actors is that they tend to rely and be ingrained much more in a religious framework than the, these neighborhood developers, and they are in a prolific and framework, and point very often to pious decisions and the choices that they make. So they will not go to the ban because it's haram to use interest. It's forbidden by religion to actually use interest. And that sets them against other developers, corporate ones and younger ones, who say that if they're forced, they go to the ban, or corporate ones who definitely point to the fact that they um, use the ban. Um, I'm going to skip this, but just here, just show you some of uh, the network that she's able to trace and the differences uh, between the three types of developers. So um, maybe just for, th these are the differences of financing. So you can see sort of before, to the left, the um, neighborhood developers are basically essentially re relying on what they call personal equity. So that's relations with siblings, that's their own work, what they've earned before that they're reinvesting. In contrast with the, what she's calling the corporate developers who actually take bank loans and the uh, amateur ones who gather anything they want. Now with the trajectories and how these individuals live the crisis, and our this thesis was much later, so we were able to document this more. And I think now in hindsight, we're seeing much more. These are three very different histories and trajectories. The neighborhood guys, just like the 30 HDD guys, have, don't have bank loans. And so when the banks fail, they, they lose whatever investments they had in the bank, but they don't benefit at all. In strong contrast from the corporate developers who had very big loans that they were able to return to the banks and to fairly low with the right in time in the last uh, few months. So. Uh, ironically, the crisis reproduces again that inequality with those who are more intertwined with the banking sector actually benefiting way more from it. Now, the biggest losers of the financial crisis are clearly the amateur ones. Uh, most of them are people who used to be um, jeweler, um, pharmacist, sold everything he has and decided that the investment was real estate in Beirut of the last decade. Uh, and of course, doesn't have enough networks to enter the municipality, doesn't have enough networks to convince getting facilities from the ban. And eventually, the, most of these guys at the time when Abdel was doing her interviews, were, had, one of them had lost everything, including his house in Al-Shabat Khan and was living in a far suburb. Uh, they still had uh, money, they didn't know how to return, loans from relatives, so you can't do to relatives what you can do to the ban. So really, um, a big section of society that had embodied this invest investor uh, subjectivity and that was really in a very difficult position. Now, I also don't want you to think that the corporate developers are this abstract capital that tries assess everything. So I picked two of these pieces examples and to show you 
um, to the right is one of the biggest um, developers in the neighborhood, which she calls corporate because he relies on bank loans because he works anywhere in the city. But when you trace the networks that this guy uses, he worked with the former prime minister, the late prime minister who was assassinated in 2005 in Saudi Arabia, came back and built essentially first in Sunni there and Beirut, has a lot of recognition and social capital through these relations, uh, positioned him as the president of an important religious organization. This, of course, attracts clients, mm -hmm. help him get land and eventually really be able to build without uh, much expansion. But again, again, it's the network that's very tied to a specific geography. They also operate in very clear geography. So these are her developers and she tried to cluster some of what they built together to show how much the geography actually is organized around a certain space. Um, so, I mean, so in some, uh, a very strong embeddedness of the economy that shows local actors um, very much as active agents. So they're not just, uh, um, I'm picking the French, they're not just uh, enduring social networks. They're actually actively invested in making them, forming them, shaping them, and transforming them in ways that organizes their territory and allows them to uh, shift and move and appropriate remittances that at that point are huge. So in, in 2009, there were about almost $8 billion in remittances. Uh, so we're talking about huge amounts for this very small country, right? And uh, so these were, uh, that, and so these guys are really very much trying to, uh, to, 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 to benefit from this. And if we push this out to the scale of the city, and that's something that we're working on now, and think about, so what if developers, is it true that developers are um, working within these geographies? So what we did here is that was one afternoon where we uh, challenged ourselves in the lab. So everyone sat and we gave the sex for every developer. And we, put it up just to see what is happening in the city. And so the 999 were one by one identified. We had about 10% we couldn't classify, but we used our phones, we asked for credit, so if we, we did all we can. And what you get is very much a geography of the civil war reproduced at the scale of redevelopment. And I think that's particularly important because when we look at this and we look at the spatial segregation, these two maps basically tell us that what is happening in the reorganization of the city is an entrenchment and the reproduction of many of the forces that existed before, but in which capital um, is basically used to reproduce, to reproduce the control of some individuals. So in sum, this is uh, when it comes to it. So, so in sum, I think that an understanding of Beirut's building boom is best explained through accounts for an analysis of its embeddedness in the context where it unfolds. Accounting for networks and practices of actors. So develop, I spoke to a lot about developers, but we're also looking at brokers, at landowners and how they're changing over time, elected council members, institutions like the central bank, um, but also city governments, religious institutions, planning agencies, political parties. So by mapping the formal and informal networks of actors and institutions coalescing in overlapping growth machines with intersecting interests to facilitate capital flow in Beirut, we find capital to flow as much through family networks and neighborhood relations uh, and to be facilitated and secured keep connected parties and villages organization. In this process, a lot of what seems like abstract capital is highly negotiated and fluctuating. So, I mean, obviously, I did have time to talk about this, but even the valuation, what do I send to who and for how much, differs very much in the cost. Um, so, I also promised to talk about busts, and I know I don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to show you very quickly uh, one uh, another application. Most people study financialization. I have actually yet to see a study of financialization of the built environment that doesn't talk about new buildings and new building activities. Um, but in practice, I think financialization looks even more like this than it looks like uh, the, the new buildings. The reason is that our estimate for now, and we're trying to survey, is about 10% of Beirut is basically held either by developers or by landowners 
in anticipation of being able to destroy it and be placed by a tower. So when we began to survey Beirut, we, or the building permits, we find about 140 building permits in the city that were basically buildings where people still lived and were negotiating their eviction while the developer had already purchased the building, filed the building permit, and was ready to start building. And that attracted our attention to this whole process in which people lived in the city with the constant anticipation of being evicted. And what's interesting about that specific stop is that it transformed very rapidly during the financial crisis. So while in 2017, most of these buildings were empty, by 2019, they were mostly full. And they were full by refugees, migrant workers, and very low income level family. Basically, people that developers call evictable people who you can throw on the street anytime you want. And so what we're seeing is the development of this extractive rentier um, mentality where um, presence in the city is very much based on, uh, is very much dependent on your ability to get some kind of space. But we're really that the relationship of people who own buildings, who own old houses, etc., is turning very much into a uh, investor subjectivity. And I, I was looking yesterday to see actually if there's any literature on that and came across this piece on Morocco that argues that in Morocco, a lot of property owners refused to uh, sell their property. I think it was Tangier. They felt that this was my family's home and I don't want to destroy it. And I think what we've seen in the last few years in Beirut is really a lot of departure from this position. And instead, and Munachishin's documented this in a couple of buildings. We've tried to document that again in a platform. That's a lot of what we do at the lab, which is part of how we think of ourselves as a research center, which is to put out there material and in Arabic and in English that basically documents what we find in very lay way, accessible to residents, to uh, journalists, etc. So precarious living is a website that you can access. I'm not, I was planning to enter it, but I won't because uh, Leila's sharing my screen. Uh, so, but if you look at it, so these are the buildings that were permitted and were inhabited. And then if you go on that website, what you see is a whole series of stories, one by one. Each one of them is actually documented in depth, telling the story of uh, how this building has been appropriated by either a developer or a landowner who wants to turn it into uh, an eventual uh, high rise. And in the meantime, how people resist the eviction, but also how, um, how uh, many people, rather than evicting, uh, sorry, rather than uh, resisting the eviction, are actually uh, trying to um, appropriate capital and use this opportunity as a moment to make profit. And every story has its historical narrative, um, very much centered on property. And this is where my interest really intersects very strongly with uh, critical legal geography, because I think that at the heart of everything that is happening that here, and that's for another conversation, there is a ownership model, a property model of uh, that follows the ownership model and that very much uh, makes all of this possible. And so this is how we see all of these becoming for rent. Um, the other thing that becomes also for rent, and that's Manhattan and Sly, is everything that was left in the city from previous cyclists, from previous booths. So these buildings were left from the 1960s booth. And again, they were empty for a very long time, but their intersection first with the refugee crisis and more recently with the financial crisis means that they are again recuperated and used in very extractive form as the last attempt to squeeze one more capital out of these physical forms. And in that sense, Beirut really differs in its case from cities like Detroit, where financialization and meltdown has been discussed, uh, precisely because no one comes and pays the mess. So colleagues in Detroit talk about the role of the municipality after 10, 15 years of landowners uh, leaving, uh, coming, taking over the property, putting it back to value. That doesn't happen to Beirut. So in this case, you're seeing buildings, and that's another uh, project we're working on buildings in Hamra, which is a very, used to be a very posh neighborhood of Beirut, all owned by investors who are in the Arab Gulf from a previous building boom in the 1970s, 
whole, whole basically <laughs> left these buildings. No one asks them what to do with it. And they're basically used by a local Lebanese uh, method person uh, to organize breads. So in some, I feel I have come to full circle to my PhD dissertation in some way, uh, going back to demonstrate the embeddedness of markets. Extending the study of housing financialization to the global south requires, I think, more than a reading of subordinate capital or the identification of a checklist of institutions or actors who would have penetrated these contexts. Instead, there's a need to adapt and extend the time space through which we analyze uh, financialization, but also actors, conduits, etc. Um, so we point to it. Uh, we, it's also really important to look at what deep societal transformations are happening uh, when the from the lucrative promise that dream, the, the euphoria of the market actually penetrates a society. The kind of speculative environment it creates, the optimism it brings, and how that optimism continues to unfold in the crisis until today. Uh, we hear that property values in Beirut don't really go down. If you ask people uh, what what is the value of this property, it's consistently overvalued, even though no one buys it. And so that context of lack of information, of unmapping, makes it so easy to maintain these fictive narratives. While in in reality, no one wants to buy anything, but we don't know. So. I think that by countering this friction with as much information as we can, by making it available uh, to the public, uh, we are trying to recover a narrative of what happened in the past 30 years in Beirut, but also I think in, others, in many other cities that have followed the same, yeah, the same thing. Thank you.